Here we're going to take a look at a two-dimensional finite elements analysis truss example problem. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we have. What we have is we have a truss composed of two truss bars, two elements with a load here at node three and constraints at nodes one and two. What we want to do is we want to be able to figure out what the displacement is at node three. And once we figure that out, then we're going to use that to figure out what the force is through each element and what the reaction forces are at nodes one and two. The process is going to be the same as any finite elements analysis problem where we first create the element stiffness matrices. We use those stiffness matrices to assemble the global stiffness matrix equation. Then we reduce that equation by applying the constraints to remove rows and columns. And then once we have a reduced matrix equation, then we go ahead and apply the nodal loads to solve for the displacements and then use those displacements to solve for the reactions and then solve for the elemental results, in this case, the elemental forces using those displacement results as well. All right, so step one is the element stiffness matrices. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the stiffness matrix in the element coordinate system. And it's composed of our axial stiffness for a truss bar, just EA over L, the Young's modulus multiplied by cross-sectional area divided by length. And remember, we're gonna assume two translation degrees of freedom at each node, so that's why we have a four by four matrix. Connects two nodes, but there are two degrees of freedom at each node. And so we have the ones in this matrix that correspond to the axis of the element. In other words, the x direction along that element because with a truss bar, there's only stiffness along its axis and the zeros correspond to the transverse direction where there is no stiffness for a truss bar. So that's the elemental coordinate system. That's the stiffness matrix there. We're also gonna go ahead and talk about the element transformation matrix. This was discussed in another video, but basically it's just a way of relating the global coordinate system with the elemental coordinate system. And so there's the element angle theta in there. So continuing, we have our stiffness matrix now in the global coordinate system. Remember when we assemble our global stiffness matrix, we want all the stiffness matrices to be in that global coordinate system. And we can do that by defining our stiffness matrix in the elemental coordinate system and then using that trans Transformation matrix that that element transformation matrix on either side to create our stiffness matrix in the global coordinate system, and so that makes us think about well, how do we create that system? What do we, what information do we need to know? It turns out it's taking a lot longer to draw this than I thought it would, so we're just going to go ahead and pop it there. There it is, a gorilla thinking hard about what information we need in order to set up that global stiffness matrix equation for each element. And we're gonna go ahead and say, well, first we need the elastic modulus. Next thing we need is the cross-sectional area. Next we need is the length. That's all gonna go into right here. That's our stiffness matrix in the elemental coordinate system. All right, next we wanna be aware of what the degrees of freedom are that it connects. Okay, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. And we also want to be aware of the element angle. That's gonna be used here for that transformation matrix on either side. All right, so continuing, just forming our elemental stiffness matrices, we're gonna go ahead and create a table here composed of the information we need to know. First, looking at element one, it connects nodes one and three. That corresponds to the degrees of freedom, one, two, five, and six, because there are two degrees of freedom per node. All right, so node one, x and y direction, that's degrees of freedom, one and two. Node three, x and y directions, that's degrees of freedom five and six. Okay, so now we go ahead and take a look at our angle theta. We're gonna go ahead and assume that it's always plus, measured from the plus x axis, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and say that we need to start at the first node defined in the element. Okay, in this case, our first node defined in the element is element, or pardon me, node one. The first node defined is element one. So we're gonna go ahead and measure from element one. We're gonna go ahead and say that counterclockwise is positive. We go ahead and take a look at this angle here theta one, beta minus 90 degrees. Well, 90 degrees has to be larger than beta, so you can see this is gonna be a negative number, which makes sense because it is actually clockwise from the plus x axis, and we say that counterclockwise needs to be positive. Okay, 
Then after that, we just go ahead and plug in elastic modulus, cross-sectional area, length. Go ahead and go on to element two. Element two connects nodes two and three. That's degrees of freedom, three, four, five, and six. Our angle is actually gonna be zero because node two is the first node that we've defined. If we defined node three as the first one, which you can do, then the angle would be 180 degrees. We just need to be consistent. That's the key part with these problems. Just need to be consistent. And then we just go ahead and plug in elastic modulus, cross-sectional area, length. Length of element two is just related to the length of element one by multiplying by sine of that angle beta. And from there, we can go ahead and construct our stiffness matrix for the element in the global coordinate system by applying theta to our transformation, our element transformation matrices, and then go ahead and applying the elastic modulus, cross-sectional area, and length to the elemental stiffness matrix in the elemental coordinate system. And then, of course, using those elemental transformation matrices, we can go ahead and get it to our stiffness matrix in the global coordinate system, which is what we want. Okay, great. So now we go ahead and go to the next part. How do we go ahead and assemble this in the global stiffness matrix? Well, first, we're going to go ahead and create that global stiffness matrix equation. Start off with being empty. Okay, note that we have two degrees of freedom per each node. And so since we have three nodes, that gives us six total degrees of freedom. And I like to write on top the, what, what degree of freedom each of those columns corresponds to. And down on the side, which, what degree of freedom, pardon me, each of those rows corresponds to. So then when we go ahead and look at our stiffness matrices for the elements, our elemental stiffness matrices, knowing that it connects degrees of freedom one, two, five, and six, we take that and we plug it in right at those corresponding degrees of freedom ranges that it corresponds to, right? So that's how that stiffness matrix for element one would get distributed. We go ahead and take a look at element two, it connects Degrees of freedom three, four, five, six. So that square box shows where all those portions would go. And that's our global stiffness matrix. Moving on to the next part is applying the constraints to our reduced matrix equation. So here we know that nodes one and two are completely pinned, so they can't translate in the x or the y direction. And so if we go ahead and put in our complete global stiffness matrix equation, we recognize that all these values are constrained. And so we go ahead and cross out all the rows that correspond to these degrees of freedom. And then we go ahead and cross out all the columns that correspond to those degrees of freedom. From there, we can go ahead and create our reduced stiffness matrix equation, which is simply that area that we shaded in there. And only all that's left. So really, we look at our free degrees of freedom, which are just degrees of freedom, five and six, corresponding to node three. That's the only node that's not constrained. All right. So now, once we have our reduced stiffness matrix equation, we can go ahead and apply the nodal loads to solve for the displacements. There is our reduced stiffness matrix equation. We just go ahead and replace our forces. So that we're just placeholders there, but now we replace it with actual forces. Nothing applied in the x direction negative p in the y direction. That's our reduced stiffness matrix. And then of course, when we wanna go ahead and solve for these displacements, all we do is we just invert that reduced stiffness matrix, multiply it against the force vector, and that gives us the results for the displacements at node three. Once we know that, then we can go ahead and solve for the reactions by taking those now known displacements, going back to our global stiffness matrix equation. We know that nodes one and two are all zero, but we now know what the results are for the displacements at node three. And we just go ahead and solve for our global force vector, which means that we're gonna actually solve for not just the reactions, but also the applied loads. That's what we have shown here. And then of course, if we want to solve for just the reactions and we just take that global force vector, which is what we get when we solve for that whole global equation. And then we just subtract the applied loads. And that's all we need to do for that. Solve for the elemental results. We just go to our elemental stiffness equations and we 
solve in the elemental coordinate system. Why? Because that's usually what we care about. We care about what's, what is that element experiencing actually. It doesn't make as much sense having some uh, transformation to those forces. And so in order to do that, here's, here's that gorilla thinking again. All right. How do we do that? Great question. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start by saying we want the elemental forces in the elemental, pardon me, elemental coordinate system. We can do that by looking at our stiffness matrix equation for the element, pardon me, in the elemental coordinate system. So there's our elemental stiffness matrix in the elemental coordinate system. And then there's our displacement in the elemental coordinate system. All right. Now, how do we get these displacements? We, we've already got them. We look at the degrees of freedom, right? So for element two, for example, we would take all those displacements that connect to it. We would take the displacements at node one, or probably node two and node three. All right. So we can do this by rearranging this equation to solve for our, still solving for the forces in the elemental coordinate system. Note that this is our elemental stiffness matrix and our displacements now in the global coordinate system. They're just applying the elemental transformation matrix in front. Now this is the easiest way to do that because this is what we know from the results that we just solved for. And so there it is, transformation to the element coordinate system. Okay, so more information about solving for this. There's our element <laughs> that we're taking a look at element one, it looks like. And this shows the equation that we're using, taking these displacements. Probably the most confusing part is what is QE3? That's the displacements for element three, right? So that's going to be the X and Y displacements at node one and the X and Y displacements at node two that would go into this vector right there. There it is, shows you just that. And if we plug those in, we'll end up getting something that looks like this, okay? Now we don't have any values, so we just have a representative value here, the force through node one. And note how the force here at node three, along the axis at node three, is the positive value. And while, pardon me, while this one here at node one is the negative value. so. We select that and say that's the axial force in element one. And we can see that if we look right there, right? A positive value of that would be intention. A positive value for this would be compression. And so that means that of course a positive value for the element would be for a force in, through the element would be intention. And so that's why we go ahead and take a look at what's happening there at node three. So here are some reflection questions. We're gonna take a look at an example system right here and what we want to do is we're going to go ahead and say that we're going to assume that the element four connects nodes three two four in that order and I want to ask well what is the angle for the element and what are the degrees of freedom for that element in order now let's go ahead and take a look at that element and see how the answer is here how those change if element four connects nodes four to three in that order. And then let's say we're able to go through, solve for the displacements, and we're going to go ahead and look at our force results. And we want to know which, which of those values, A, B, C, and D, which, which one would correspond to the axial force in element four? Likewise, which ones should be zero if these are truss elements? And finally, which global degrees of freedom would be constrained in this model? All right, and that's all we have for this example. Thank you.